Screenless. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Creative Cuppa. Alongside many of the creative arts, the future of cinema is something that's widely discussed at the moment. It's impossible to say what the future holds for that whole industry, and events in general seem to be on the cliff edge with no possible solutions. If you're in the performing arts, feel free to get in touch to let me know what's happening with your work. You can contact via at Screenless Pod on the social media or email hello at thesoundboutique.com. Today, then, we look both backwards and forwards. Neil Brand, apart from being a marvellous creative cuppa guest, has been immersed in the silent film world for the last few decades. You'll know him from the Sound Of series on BBC4. The Sound Of Movie Musicals is repeating right now and with a brand new series out at Christmas. So, pop the kettle on and join us for our chat. Neil Brand? Silent film pianist, composer, writer, broadcaster. Welcome to Creative Cuppa. Thank you, Gareth. Pleasure. So I've chatted with a few music types over the lifetime of this podcast, uh, which isn't that long, but I've never chatted with anyone who does what you do. Mm. So can you tell me what inspired you to become a silent film pianist? Um, I can't say I was inspired to do it at all. Uh, it I sort of fell into it slightly. <laughs> When I first left university, I was in the weird position of having done a drama degree, but done an awful lot of music with it. I hadn't actually trained as a musician particularly, but I'd done a load of music uh, for shows and I'd been writing music and I could always play well by ear. So I was going to become an actor musician. And at the same time, there was a bigger ambition, which I didn't think was even remotely reachable at the time we're talking like 19, early 1980s, of becoming a film composer or a TV composer and of writing music for film and TV. And I got invited to play piano for a silent film for a film society in Eastbourne in Sussex and realised that this was actually a really good way of learning the trade and that maybe this would lead on to me becoming a film composer. And it took one movie, which was the Buster Keaton film Steamboat Bill Jr., to discover that I had a real facility for sitting in front of a film and just cooking up music on the spot that fitted with what the movie needed and which actually sounded like a score. I didn't plan more than about 12 minutes of music for this 75-minute film. And something took me over. I'll tell you what, it was actually it was the audience. And oh, wow. it was okay. the adrenaline and it was the sense of being in front of people and hearing laughter. And as the laughs grew, the music got a bit bigger. And after about half an hour, I was playing music I'd never heard before. Wow. And that still is the yeah. case. That's, that's kind of how it's, it's grown over the years. What, uh, what I found I was doing over the years was, I mean, first of all, I would just gush music all over the film and I would just come in and... <laughs> And I guess what I've tried to learn uh, in the 30 years since is how far less is more and how far you can get the same effect by doing a bit less. And as I get older, that becomes even more important. I hope by by the time I'm 80, I will have got down to a kind of minimalism, which still allows me to do the job, but I don't actually have to touch the piano too often. It's interesting because writing to picture, I do that. uh, And Mm. we have the dialogue to stay clear of which yeah. you don't have in a silent film. Um, so you have yeah. to almost come up with these motifs and melodies for the voices, for the dialogue. Sort of. It's one of the lovely things about silent film. It, you, you don't have effects or dialogue or indeed a director to get in the way. The director's mm. dead. So right. you, have to, you have the whole space to make of your own. And not having the dialogue there does mean that... It's, you can kind of do a sort of leitmotif thing with the music fitting with the character, but it's more likely to fit with the dynamics of a scene. Right. So the music is underscoring in exactly the same way it would for a film. The dynamics going on between two people talking 
And so yeah. when you have dialogue happening very in a very small space in which two people are sort of whispering to each other, you will take the music right down. You will give a dynamic to it that's going to match what's going on in that in that sequence. But at the same time, there are certain moments, and it's funny, uh, the Pythons got this, uh, that every now and then you'll get a big, impressive landscape with lovely music. You know, Every now and then a film, even a silent <laughs> film, will open up out of some little domestic thing and give you a massive great vista or a great big kind of introductory montage to something. And that's when you can just let fly. That's when you know the music has got to wow. really speak through. The rest of the time, you're kind of gliding behind the film. And when people say, I'd forgotten you were there, that's, that's a real compliment. And when people say, um, if, with my orchestral stuff, if they say, we forgot there was an orchestra there, that's a mighty compliment. Uh because that <laughs> wow yes that is really quite something to not notice anymore yeah you know? yeah and i suppose being in your position you become part pianist and part music and film historian in a way because of mm. all these amazing uh movies that have been uh and now coming back to life yeah i don't play anything like what the music would have been at the time that's that's nice though in a way isn't it that you're kind of having a new take on on something and i think it needs it there are people who play music that would have been played at the time, and that's fine. But I think you need to yeah. to reinvent these films for a modern audience. I think that's the point of being a musician in 2020, mm -hmm. is to make something that worked to treat in 1925 work 95 years later. Um, and that's yeah. also it's the challenge, and it's the fun, and it's, it's, it's everything that's worth doing about these films. But at the same time, yeah, I'm being a, a musician and I'm being a dramaturgist because also I'm 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 looking at how the drama's working. I'm looking at where I think it needs bringing out musically, and there's a little element of it mm. that that is also a historian, but really only mm. enough for me to be able to contextualise the film. After that, as far as I'm concerned, I'm playing for the audience that are sitting there now. Yeah. And there was a review of your score to Anthony Asquith's Underground mm. that said silent film is closer to opera than much contemporary cinema, which I thought was really interesting. I think that's true. It's because the music is the only game in town. So you only have yeah. the score. So the music does have to embody absolutely everything. And it's interesting, what finding what I did with silent film took me into a new area of composition in that I started writing what I've called concert dramas, which we've done for the radio. So I did uh, an adaptation of Wind in the Willows and an adaptation of Christmas Carol in which actors acted the scenes and I adapted those so that they fitted and then I scored the whole thing right through so that the entire show is underscored with an orchestra. And it's like listening to a perfect film soundtrack because you have got dialogue there. You have got the music doing everything else. So the music will be, I mean, in the case of Christmas Carol, it will be flying, it will be the sea, it will be snow falling, it will be ghosts on the stairs, <laughs> it will be the sound of London, it will be the sound of a fireplace. And that is just brilliant to do because, again, it's like silent film. It's like, it is like opera, except that it's sort of spoken opera. Amazing. Many people will know you from your Sound Of series. Mm. I believe Sound Of movie musicals is repeating on BBC4. It is. Right now. So I yeah. urge everyone to go and see that because it's absolutely magical. I personally loved Sounds of Cinema, Sound of Movie Musicals. Uh, was there a Sound of Musicals as well? There was. Oh, this is, uh, in it, fact, coming this Christmas but, will be my fifth series, which is Sound of TV. Oh, wow. Oh, fabulous. About the music written for television. Uh, you know, it is, it's, it's got an element of history to it, but it's actually less a history. It's more of a kind of investigation of all the different ways that music gets used with TV. Oh, that's wonderful. I was going to ask you, will there be more? So, But that's answered <laughs> that very nicely. I think the first one's going out December the 4th. Fabulous. So what's it been like making those programmes for you? Oh, I've been a kid in a sweet shop five times now. <laughs> and, and each time I think, you know, this is, this is it. There's not going to be another one. And each time we manage to find another area that people are fascinated by. And I think this has been the biggest surprise 
When I did Sound of Cinema back nearly 10 years ago, I was amazed that people were just keen to hear somebody sitting at a piano analysing a piece of, of film music. Because uh, I always thought that was kind of like the, the open university programmes I grew up with in the 1970s, where at the end of a TV day, you'd suddenly cut to these long-haired university lecturers standing in front of blackboards <laughs> explaining physics or chemistry or something. But actually, it seems that the more you unpack something we're all used to and the more you tell people how music works in a field that we just take for granted... The, the more interested they are. And that's mm. been a, a, a wonderful thing to find out. So going deeper into films by doing movie musicals, because also we had specifically not done musicals when we did Sound of Cinema, because it's just such a huge area. And, you know, there was so much to say about film music generally anyway, that to come back and do movie musicals and specifically look at why musicals work, what they're doing, how they're working, and, and get an international perspective as well. So, you know, we, we, we disappear yeah. off to Moscow to look at how Stalin actually encouraged musicals in Soviet Russia as a sort of uh, a way of putting across Amazing. the party line, but with lots of high kicks and dancing and lovely tunes, you know. <laughs> Fabulous. What got, really got me um, watching Sound of Cinema was that how recent it was, yeah. how recent this has all been, you know. Mm. We're barely 100 years from uh, when it all kicked off mm. and um, look where it is now. It's, a, it's quite astonishing, really, isn't it? It the, is. The journey it's taken. And continues to grow, I think. You know, that's one of the fascinating things about movie music yeah. is that what we consider to be a film score changes year by year. So that now yeah. you can take a movie, I mean, I'm going back a little bit now, but you can take a film, for instance, uh, in which you have a very minimal score, mostly electronic, but that score is doing vast amounts with the drama, as opposed to you know a huge yeah. orchestra blaring at you or a, a beautiful, heartbreaking solo piano. And we as an audience, I think, have become much more kind of conditioned to feel the music you know, to actually understand what the mm. music's doing. Before I made any of these programmes, I was always very aware that these were subjects we all had a say in if if we were allowed to. You know, we we all know, we, we come out of a cinema going, well, that was great, but I thought the music was terrible. Or, you know, I really like the music for this <laughs> or the music for that. And to actually now get to the stage where people can go, oh, well, I can see why that's working that way and that's not working that way yeah. and that sounds like that it's um it it continues to evolve and thank goodness for it absolutely it'd be interesting to see where movie soundtracks are in 10 years 20 years well it'd be interesting to see where cinema <laughs> is in 10 or 20 years it's well ex exactly yes i think that is definitely a discussion for another time mm. but for now neil brand thank you so much for joining me for a cuppa Pleasure, Gareth. Take care. Thanks again to Neil for joining me. Don't forget that Sound of TV will be airing on December the 4th. Give it a watch. I think it's fair to say I'll be in that night. You can find out more about Neil at his website, neilbrand.com, and he's on Twitter too. Links are in the show notes. A little bit of housekeeping now. Uh, another podcast I produce and host with my friend Dan Watts is starting its second season on Friday the 6th of November. Making a Soundtrack Season 2 will look at the journey of the orchestral soundtrack from composer to screen, and we've chatted with some amazing people in roles you might not think about when watching a film or TV show, like who prepares the music or who conducts the orchestra, for instance. We have a guest host joining us too, so search for Making a Soundtrack in your podcast app and subscribe, and there'll be updates via the usual social media. That's at Screenless Pod. That's it for this episode, so until next time, thanks so much for joining me for a cuppa. <laughs> <laughs>